Connor Burns, you are a minister in the Northern Ireland office. You're also now the Prime Minister's special representative to the United States on the Northern Ireland Protocol. Has the government admitted that when it signed up to this deal back in 2019, it got it wrong? No, I think the government is being informed by the lived experience of 18 months of protocol actually implemented on the ground. We signed up to it in theory to protect the European single market. We were leaving the European Union. It was part of the mechanism to create the new uh, movement of goods within uh, the island of Ireland, where you have one part of the UK that has left the EU on the island and one country, the Republic of Ireland, that remains uh, in the EU. And I think what we're saying to the EU is that we signed it. It had provisions within it under Article 13 to change bits of it or even to replace it in its entirety. It had Article 16 provision to uh, unilaterally for either side to change or suspend bits of it if they felt it was disrupting trade or having societal impact. And I think what we're now saying to the EU is, look, 18 months on, we can see how there are companies in GB who've stopped supplying to uh, Northern Ireland. And we need to find a way where we can recognise that a lot of the goods that come into Northern Ireland stay in Northern Ireland. They never go near uh, the European single market, the Republic of Ireland. And let's just have a way of treating those goods differently. Article 13.8 and Article 16 have been repeatedly cited by your colleagues over the last few weeks, indeed over the last 16 months as these talks have been going on with the European Union. Is it fair to say that potentially when the United Kingdom negotiated the, this deal, uh, the United Kingdom government anticipated a moment like this, anticipated that changes may need to be made? Well, it's correct to say that we didn't know what the actual situation would be on the ground as the new arrangements evolved. And we are now sort of relying on those uh, things in the, in the protocol, which pointed the way potentially to change them. And despite, by the way, what was said today by the Foreign Secretary in the statement, we are very, very clear, she said it herself, we still want a negotiated solution to this. What we are pointing to is the solutions that we have tabled with the EU, a trusted trader scheme, uh, strong criminal penalties for anyone who breached the trusted trader scheme. Um, just to treat the goods differently from those going into Northern Ireland and staying there and those going on uh, into the Republic of Ireland into the single market. We now have 18 months of lived experience to inform uh, our approach to this and we think that there are very practical solutions that would rely heavily on data sharing in real time with the European Union enforcement authorities that could make this work. It's fair to say the EU have not been the most cooperative over these past 16 months of negotiations. I was speaking uh, to your colleague uh, Jacob Rees-Mogg, the Cabinet Minister for uh, Brexit Opportunities last week. He told me he thinks the EU is trying to punish the UK and that's why it's being uncooperative in these discussions. Do you share that view? I can see why uh, Jacob uh, feels that. I can see why uh, Jacob said that. I think in my role as a, as a Northern Ireland office minister, I need to focus much more on the detail of how we fix this for everyone in Northern Ireland, how we dial down the politics, get it onto the, the technicalities of the solutions to allow goods to move freely within our own country, save of course for animal stuff that have always been checked between islands regardless of territorial jurisdictions and crucially unlock the, uh, the challenge of getting devolved government back. Ultimately peace was arrived at in Northern Ireland through a series of difficult compromises. Some would say some political fudges. Uh, is it the case that really when we're going to solve the Northern Ireland protocol issue what is required here is a lot more give and potentially a little bit of a fudge. What is required is an understanding of what's at risk. Uh, the devolved institutions are at risk if we can't resolve the protocol. It requires compromise, it requires uh, understanding, um, and it, understa it's, it requires a, a political determination to find the space in which to fix this. And yet within the EU we're not seeing that political determination as things stand. In fact, the response, the immediate response from the European Union to the statement that Liz Truss gave to Parliament was that they would uh, potentially carry out repercussions upon the UK. They didn't use the words trade war, but it, they came very close to it. Are we inching towards a trade war with Europe? The most important thing for us is fixing this and fixing it so that we can get revived, devolved government in Northern Ireland. This is more important to get this right for our United Kingdom and for the communities in Northern Ireland than almost any other foreign policy or economic uh, objective. And that is our 
determination. We hope that the EU will re-engage with us in a spirit of compromise and create the necessary space to allow us to find a way through that. But we will legislate in the interests of our own country if that's what it comes to. Is that a threat? No, it's just a reality. We cannot stand by as the government of the United Kingdom uh, whilst this is going on in Northern Ireland and there isn't a local government in Northern Ireland delivering for our citizens in the six counties. Could you give me an estimation? What is the likelihood of the EU going along with the UK in these negotiations versus needing to use this legislative route? How likely is it that the EU will cooperate here? Well, none of us know the answer to that, but the whole history of our engagement with the EU, the negotiations since we had the vote to leave the European Union back in 2016, are lots of things that we were initially told were impossible actually coming to pass. Uh, and I just hope that the, the declaration by the government of our intention to legislate if we can't reach uh, and agree compromise with the EU will, will trigger everybody having a serious look at this again and reaching solutions that work. Work for us, work for the EU, work for the Irish Republic, but crucially work for communities in Northern Ireland. Now last week you gained a new <coughs> title, that of the Prime Minister's special envoy to the United States on the protocol. Clearly the US takes a big interest in peace in Northern Ireland. They see themselves as a guarantor of the Belfast Agreement. Um, why is it that you achieved that new title last week? I think the Prime Minister just wanted um, some serious engagement in the US. The US are heavily emotionally invested in the uh, process that led to the institutions that sprang from Belfast Good Friday. There's a great affection for Ireland, for the United Kingdom in America. And I think the Prime Minister wanted me to go and to talk to our American friends and allies and help them uh, see the full context of where we are um, and hopefully give them an additional perspective uh, on the challenges and why we may have to take the action we may have to take. Do you think the Americans get it? The UK government says again and again that it wants to take action to protect the Belfast Good Friday Agreement, whereas much commentary, and particularly commentary on the EU side of things, seems to suggest that the protocol is supporting the Good Friday Agreement, whereas the Unionist community in Northern Ireland and the British government say precisely the opposite. Well, the protocol as it's currently being implemented and interpreted is the cause of the Unionist groupings not wanting to go back into power sharing. Power sharing are the direct product of the Belfast Good Friday Agreement. So it is the protocol that is now imperiling the institutions. Do the Americans understand <coughs> that? I think, the, uh, I think the audience in the United States is incredibly receptive to hearing more about what's actually going on in Northern Ireland, understanding the societal challenges, understanding the trade frictions, understanding that products are disappearing off shelves in Northern Ireland that have been available for, for decades, and understanding in greater detail the, the practical technical solutions that we have tabled to the EU that meet their objectives, meet the objectives of the Irish, meet our objectives and deliver for Northern Ireland and would restore power sharing in Northern Ireland. If this all collapses, if power sharing is not restored, if the EU levels trade repercussions upon the United Kingdom, if this all falls apart, what does that say about the Prime Minister's Brexit negotiation? Has Brexit failed? Brexit has not failed. We've got a technical problem, um, which is informed now by 18 months of data <coughs> in Northern Ireland. We've got to fix this. If it fails, it shows that we are not able to engage pragmatically with our closest neighbour and ally, the European Union. And I would hope that what's been seen in Ukraine and the aftermath of the tragic events there is that Britain is a reliable ally, Britain is a friend, Britain is wedded to shared values and we surely must be able to find the landing ground to sort this out in all our interests. Connor Burns, thank you. Thank you.